Hello, my name is Dave Emenheiser, and it is my pleasure to serve as the president of the RPV Council of Homeowners Associations. On behalf of uh, CHOA and the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce, welcome. Uh, this is, I don't know, probably the fifth or sixth or maybe tenth time that we've uh, uh, put on these kinds of events uh, as an opportunity to educate the public about uh, the candidates. And so, um, Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, let me do some thank yous and introductions. Kathy Edgerton is one of our board members. Raise your hand, Kathy. Glenn Cornell. Jack Ferris in front. Jeff Richards in front. There are timekeepers. Krista Johnson in the back who welcomed you this evening. And where is Marie Churro? Oh, she just stuck her head in. And Kathy, who am I forgetting? Yes, I did get in Thank you very much. Uh, so there are a lot of people to thank, in particular uh, our, our wonderful pro partner, uh, Eileen Hupp, who uh, uh, the president of the, of the uh, chamber wasn't able to make it tonight. Uh, Terry DeCola, uh, who Jeff in particular should be thankful for because she and, and uh, uh, Carlos Rivera of RPV TV uh, put together the, the link for us tonight. And, uh, you know, these events take a lot of work from a lot of wonderful uh, staff members and volunteers. And so thank you all. Uh, and then let me, uh, let me introduce uh, Robert Bobich uh, from the Chamber of Commerce because uh, uh, to say a few words. There we go, oh, over here. Yeah, I lost you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert Bobich, and I'm an RPV resident, and I serve as a board member for the Palos Verdes Chamber of Commerce. So uh, the chamber is co-hosting this month a series of candidates, forums covering all four local elections as a service to the community. In our mission as a catalyst for business growth, a convener of leaders and influencers, and champion for a strong community, the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce believes in the importance of providing opportunities for our businesses and residents to learn about the candidates in our local elections. The Chamber is an independent nonprofit membership organization, and we are nonpartisan and do not endorse candidates. We do, however, actively advocate for business at all levels of government. All businesses, regardless of your location, are invited to join our membership. In addition, we invite you to attend our annual legislative forum and luncheon on Friday, October 18th. Invited speakers are Congressman Ted Liu, Senator Ben Allen, Assembly Member Al Murachucci, and Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. Tickets are available for purchase on the Chamber's website, and there's a flyer at the check-in table back there. Um, thank you to CHOA. I just want to share our, our our teamwork here is unbelievable. Your partnership in co-hosting tonight's forum. And thank you to the candidates um, for stepping forward to run. It takes courage and commitment to run for local office. And the Chamber of Commerce applauds your interest in serving our community. We wish you all the best. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, the candidates are going to introduce themselves here shortly, but I just, I just want to say that it's been a difficult year for RPV, and uh, let's all uh, congratulate the five candidates who had the courage to step forward to run for office this year. It's my great pleasure to uh, introduce our moderator this evening. Jerry Dehovic was born in San Pedro, grew up mostly in the, uh, the east side of Rancho Palos Verdes. He's a graduate of, of the U.S. Air Force Ac Academy and a former Air Force officer. He is an owner, a partner, director of a large uh, investment uh, brokerage in Orange County. He uh, uh, previously had served as the president of the Nautilus HOA and currently serves as the president of the Seaview HOA if you're looking for a tough job. 
In 2011, Cherry was elected to the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council, served two terms from 2011 to 2019, and during his uh, tenure, he served as the mayor of Pro Tem three times and the mayor in 2014 and 2019. Let's welcome Cherry Dovic. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, sir. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Dave. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. I see a lot of uh, familiar faces out in the crowd, and uh, that's a wonderful treat for me. I really enjoy being here with all of you. Thank you. And also, thank you for joining us on this special evening. This is the first and possibly the only RPV City Council candidate forum. There's one in the works. Uh, it may happen. We'll see. We'll see what happens in the very near future. Uh, but this is an important night. Uh, campaign season and the election season is in full swing. The election is less than seven weeks away. We have an extremely full agenda tonight. We want to get to all your questions. Please feel free to bring the questions forward or somehow, I don't know, I think there's people running and grabbing your questions out there. But I would be remiss. I know people um, already recognized Eileen and Robert. Uh, I want to personally recognize them and their team at the chamber. And Eileen, she's home ill, so let's just give her a round of applause because I'm sure she'll see this, please. <laughs> and also Dave Emanizer and Kathy Edgerton and, and uh, the other board members that were introduced earlier from the Council of Homeowners Associations. They did work uh, very collegially to put this together. A lot of phone calls behind the scenes. I was just on the, the periphery of that, but I know what it takes to put this on. So let's give them a round of applause too, please. And it, it, it uh, tickles me to see city staff here again. I haven't seen several of the, uh, the individuals who are here tonight. I do want to recognize them as volunteers uh, from the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, and they're working behind the scenes to make this all happen. So let's give them a round of applause. And as Dave said, most of all, we want to thank and recognize the five candidates who you'll be hearing from shortly. Uh, one candidate couldn't make it, Michelle Carboni. She had uh, uh, an accident. She's okay. She was planning on being here via Zoom, but uh, logistically it, we couldn't make it happen. So we wish her well and uh, we miss her and hopefully we'll see her at the next event. Uh, we also have uh, Jeff Chen via Zoom. He wasn't uh, able to make it personally here, but uh, we welcome him and we will try and accommodate him as time goes on. Uh, I'll let the other three individuals who are here introduce themselves. But before we get started, I just want to say serving on council uh, is indeed an honor and a privilege. And I know it firsthand. Um, it's a very important position in this city in that the decisions that the body makes affects the entire city and the peninsula at large. It can obviously affect our quality of life, the quality of our in infrastructure, our safety, our pocketbooks, including things such as taxes, property values, just to name a few. But as we are all keenly aware, there's a large part of the southern section of our city that is experiencing significant tumult as we sit here tonight due to unprecedented land movement. There is so much going on there that's extremely complex and problematic in nature. And again, I know firsthand I can't, I have to recognize the rest of uh, the Seaview board. I'm, I'm, I'm just a, a small piece of that. And those volunteers uh, do work beyond what anyone should have to do and what is expected of them. So I'm gonna just acknowledge that board. Um, Please, thank you. I do also want to say our thoughts and prayers are with our neighbors that are suffering over there. If you really don't know what's going on, I think everyone does. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just terrible, just beyond terrible to be uprooted like that. That said, as our hearts go out to our fellow residents experiencing these trials and tribulations, there are 42,000 other residents living throughout the remainder of our city that look to the city council for direction and leadership. This next council will be faced with extremely daunting tasks and decisions. And I can't emphasize that enough. Just think about what these people are putting themselves uh, in line for over the next four years. It's just, it really is monumental. 
what they're facing. Our shared goal, I'm sure, as a community and our wish for the next council is that you govern in a steadfast, judicious, pragmatic, empathetic manner and make as you make these very serious decisions. Finally, let me say that putting oneself out into the public arena as a volunteer to serve the community is a daunting and challenging and time-consuming task. It is also something that should be commended and lauded by all. So one last time, we're about to get started here. Let's give these, these uh, candidates one more round of applause. I'm just gonna briefly go over some ground rules for tonight. This forum is designed to hear directly from the candidates for City of Rancho Palos Verde City Council. There are two seats. The time limits tonight will be strictly adhered to and are as follows. Each candidate will have two minutes uh, for an opening and closing statement. Each candidate will also have two minutes to answer a given question. I will also give them a 15 second warning. And as I told the gentleman and uh, Jeff, I didn't get to tell you, I'm pretty strict on that 15 second thing. I'm gonna cut you off, so. Um, questions will be taken in writing from the audience throughout the evening. Please feel free to ask a question. We'd like you to ask questions. Please understand that in the hope of covering as many topics as possible, we may eliminate some duplicative questions. We may not get to yours exactly, but we'll do our best. Um, in the order of answering questions tonight, we'll rotate throughout the evening. The order was randomly selected. The seating was randomly selected prior to uh, all of you showing up here. Rebuttal to candidates' answers will not be permitted with the sole exception that I, as the moderator, reserve the right to allow rebuttal if a candidate specifically calls out or quotes another candidate, and I believe in my sole discretion that in the spirit of fairness, rebuttal is warranted. Rebuttal will be limited to 45 seconds. As an FYI, this forum is being recorded by RPV TV for future broadcast and will, can, may be viewed on RPV TV's YouTube channel. Individuals are permitted to record tonight if you're so inclined, but if you do so, please be courteous to your neighbors and don't stand up in front of anyone to, uh, to block their view. Uh, to allow the candidates as much time as possible to speak, we will be, we will be running straight through to 9 p.m. with no breaks. That said, if you need to take a break, and this goes for the candidates too, please stand up and do so and judge your time accordingly. Uh, we appreciate your courtesies to do so quietly. Finally, this forum will be run in a polite, professional, and respectful manner. Remember these candidates are our neighbors who are stepping forward as candidates, and they've signaled their willingness to serve our community. We appreciate the audience's cooperation and adherence to maintaining a polite and respectful forum for all of these candidates. With that, we will begin with opening statements and we will start with David Chura. David, you have two minutes. Hi, I'm Dave Chura. My wife Marie and I have lived in RPV for 25 years. Our two daughters were educated in PV schools and we found our church family here in RPV. Uh, we've both done volunteer work in the community and I'm currently serving on the RPV Planning Commission. And now that I'm running, I'm out there talking to lots of people and everyone asks me the very same question when I meet them, which is, are you insane? <laughs> Who wants to be in the Planning Commission in this time, and my answer is simple. This is the perfect time for me to be running. There is a very strong correlation between my background and experience and the major problems in our city. The landslide is a very complex technical problem, which is something I'm very familiar with. I've been a tech executive entrepreneur for over 30 years, and I'm not intimidated by the technical complexity of this. In fact, I'm energized by it because I think I can help. I've been the chief technology officer in multiple startups, where if you're in a startup, you have to build a team under a strict budget, then you have to, then you have to perform and deliver or the company goes under. I'm used to operating under that pressure, but I've also been involved in larger companies. I was a director in, at Northrop Grumman in a $600 million business unit, and I eventually rose to be a fellow, which is the highest uh, technical position you can have in the company. Um, now, like the landslide, the state of California is coming down on us as well. I'm a very strong proponent of local control 
And I joined the Planning Commission four years ago with the specific intent to try to build ordinances that would limit density in our housing. And we were successful at doing that in the first year, but then it all started to come much worse. 15 as seconds. The state and the, thank you, and the state and the uh, city have to continue to go back and forth. Now there's lots of other issues, including uh, crime, Civic Center, uh, Western Avenue, but I'd like uh, to thank you for uh, coming here tonight and uh, hope to get your support. Thank you, David. Next, George Lewis. Well said, Dave, we agree on a lot, actually. Um, good evening, everybody, how are you? It's a real pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the Homeowners Association and the Chamber for putting this event on and giving us a chance to meet each other. Yeah, pull your mic forward a little bit more. There you go, George. All right, I'll, I'll thank again the Chamber and the Homeowners Association for giving us this opportunity to get to know each other. And uh, that's really what I think tonight for me is about. I'm a new candidate. I've never run for anything before. Uh, like my colleagues here, we've all served as volunteers on various committees and have a long history with the city. Um, we did so for many of the same reasons. I'm all in on RPV. Uh, my 90% of my assets are tied up in my house. My two most priceless assets, my boys, go to school in the school system here. So my interests align with your interests, which align with the improvement and the betterment of the city. Um, but what I think the opportunity here tonight is, of course, I want you to learn about me and what I believe in and what I'm running for. But I think the things that I'm running for, and you can see them on my cards outside and on my website, and they'll come out through the questioning here today, are only part of the package. The other part is what I'm going to learn about if I'm lucky to be elected from you. And so part of it tonight is through your questions, I'm going to learn about your concerns. I'm not going to pretend that anybody could know everything going on in the whole city. I live on the east side. There could be a major issue over on the west side with traffic or a nuisance or something. I have no idea about it. I might get a question on it. I won't have any idea. So this is an opportunity for me tonight to hear from you in a formal way and learn about what your concerns are, and I welcome it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Jeff Chen. How you doing there, Jeff? Hey, how's it going? Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Chen, and I'm a uh, city council candidate. Uh, I want to thank the RPV um, uh, CHOA and the PVP uh, Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this forum. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a lifelong Peninsula resident. I was actually born and raised an, on the Hill. Uh, I ch attended Chadwick uh, from K through 12, um, snorkeled at um, Marine Land, uh, and enjoyed the park until its closure. Uh, explored the tide pools, uh, played in the canyons, which is now uh, sea breeze. Um, like may maybe some of you, uh, I've been asked to be uh, slowed down uh, by um, the, the infamous uh, Deputy Lopez and now the infamous uh, Officer Durant. Uh, I got married in uh, Terrania uh, and uh, moved to RPV in 2010. Um, and my kids uh, currently uh, attend elementary school in the school district uh, today. Uh, my background, uh, I'm a technology engineer, uh, previously also worked as a, a recycling plants uh, director, um, a small business owner, and a, a youth basketball coach. Um, I've, with my professional experience, I've worked with cities and counties um, in building uh, businesses, and I've dealt with them. So I believe that background will serve um, well within, within the city. Uh, unlike the other candidates, um, I do not have not uh, participated in other, um, uh, sorry, uh, in other um, groups uh, within the city, uh, but I, I like to bring my uh, private sector background uh, to um, the city uh, and uh, 15 learn seconds. more about um, uh, your concerns. Uh, I want to thank you for your, your time. If I may, a housekeeping issue. Jeff, can you see when they're raising these paddles here or no, do you need me to, I, you can't see it. No, no. Okay. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to tell you one 30 and 15 so as not to interrupt you just to let you know what's going on. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank All you. Right, great. And finally we have Steve Peristam. Steve. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Steve Peristam, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone for coming out tonight, and thanks to the Chamber and for CHOA. I've lived in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes since 1984. My wife, Carol, and I have raised three children here. Each attended our PV schools, K through 12. All of us have participated in the educational, athletic, cultural activities provided by the city and the community. 
And just as important, giving back to the community has always been an important part of our lives as well. My active involvement in the city and broader community has spanned more than 35 years. In the service of the city, I've served as a four-term planning commissioner, including two years as chair, completing service just this past June 30th. I'm a co-author of the city's View Preservation Ordinance, Prop M, which in 1989 was passed by two-thirds of the voters of our city. I'm a CHOA board member, the organization that's co-sponsoring this event. Thank you. I'm an active member of the California Cities for Local Control. I'm sure we'll speak about that shortly. And I was a resident of Seaview Association, vice president, and actually a CHOA rep at the time. And finally, I was an AYSO ref for 25 years, including two years as chief ref, with responsible for 300 refs. Maybe some of you and your kids have yelled at me once or twice. <laughs> I'm okay with that. As my past uh, involvements demonstrate, I'll be an active and engaged city council member. As importantly, I will hit the ground running because I know the city, I know it well, very well. This isn't a time for on-the-job training. The landslide issue has is changed our city and needs of its residents. It has directly affected hundreds of our homes along PV South who have lost utilities and trying to urgently figure out how to stay in their homes. They require all the assistance we can provide. But make no mistake, the slide affects all this us in the city. It affects our traffic situation, affects our home values, it affects our financial strength. I'm sure that I'll be addressed all these in more detail coming up. It doesn't change the fact that we must keep our cities safe in, in the state of California and we must repair our roads. Thank you, I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. All right, let's start with uh, a little bit of a softball question. <clears throat> Excuse me. What will be your top priorities for accomplishment if you were elected as a member of the city council? How would you measure your success? Let's start with Dave, please. Well, th this isn't very hard to go through for me. I mean, obviously the landslide is the, is the first priority and I break that down into two pieces, the relief effort for helping people affected and the mitigation effort for trying to stabilize this hill for the long term. Um, second priority is definitely uh, the housing element or what we call high density housing or local control. I said before, I'm a big advocate of that. I've also been a volunteer for the California Cities for Local Control and I'm a, donated significantly to Our Neighborhood Voices, another organization dedicated to local control. After that, we have public safety. There's the Civic Center. I have Western Avenue. There's a lot of things to talk about. Uh, the question of how to measure this, I think some of these are, are going to be fairly straightforward. I mean, we know um, that we're going to get feedback from our citizens on the landslide, the relief effort, the mitigation effort. They're very vocal. We'll hear from them. I think that is a measure that we I would look to. Are we really serving the community there? Uh, in the housing element uh, or the high density housing, um, we measure that really by making sure that we have some control over this. Um, I'd like to see a lot of our builders remedies um, either delayed or maximally um, uh, slowed down. I don't think they're uh, good for our city and um, I think we need to work on that and, and measure those. Um, luckily we have a approved housing element so there will be no more builders remedies but we still have 12 of them in the hopper and uh, 20 possible uh, sites. Um, I'd certainly like to see public safety enhanced. I'm a, I'm a advocate of the, of the public safety division that's being created by the city as a way to augment our, our um, 15, 15 as, uh, augment our, our uh, police force uh, from the sheriff's organization. I'm also a big advocate of Western Avenue. That's a very important part of our city. We wanna see it beautified. We wanna see all of those done. Thank you. George. Uh, again, I agree with a lot of what you said, Dave. You'll see on my website the density is a big question, uh, you know, big problem in my mind. Uh, we're not interested in high rises in RPV, and we should do everything we can that's that's uh, has any chance of being productive to stop it. The landslide, of course, is is right here, present in our face, and we need to do everything we can to mitigate that. But I think I'm going to take my time here to consider for a moment things that we might when we get past these issues, because there's there is a future for the city beyond. I think part of that is a new civic center. Um, we currently have city employees working in a bunker with neither heat nor air conditioning. And uh, a city is run a lot by the staff. And to attract a good staff, you have to have good working conditions. And so I think it's a priority for us to build a civic center that includes 
good, good office space for staff where we can attract the best people to take care of our city. And uh, we need to do that in a fiscally responsible way. Obviously, if you um, hold a panel and ask everybody what they want, you're going to have, uh, you know, dog runs and amphitheaters and, you know, who knows what. But really what we need is a good office space, a good place for the city council, for the public to come and make their air their grievances and for city workers to work. So that's one thing. I think for me also the environment will always, the environment is a never ending question. It goes forever. And I do believe you think globally, but you act locally and what we can do here to keep our city one of the most beautiful cities around um, through habitat preservation, green spaces and things like that. Um, I would be very interested in working on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, two minutes. Great. So uh, for me, uh, for success, um, obviously, number one would be uh, mitigating the uh, landslide um, and uh, helping the residents um, uh, in those areas. Uh, number two would be a promotion of local businesses along Western Avenue and then also expanding um, the commercial tax base uh, to help uh, expand the city's revenue uh, so we're less reliant just on uh, our property tax uh, to support the city. Um, I also look to uh, increase uh, public safety uh, and then increase the cell phone coverage in RPV. Um, and uh, one of the important things for me uh, as well um, would be expanding uh, youth, youth and senior programs uh, through the Parks and Recs Department, um, such as uh, additional um, you know, sport programs. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Steve. Thank you. Uh, for me, this has been the same two issues over the last few years. First one, we have an acute situation with the landslide, and the second is our chronic situation with local control. So they're number one and number two, and we're in an ongoing battle with both of those. For the landslide, we'll be able to measure that. We'll know where we are in two years. We're gonna be in a better spot. We need a new plan. We'll go into some more detail when we get a specific question on the landslide. But we have a new opportunity right now to do a reassessment with the changing situation that we, we've just discovered in the last six weeks. So that's number one. Second is the ongoing battle with, the, with the, unfortunately the state of California for local control. We've been, for the most part, the last six years, we're losing. We're losing this battle. But that doesn't mean we're gonna lose the war here. I think as people have experienced builder's remedy projects, they're getting an awareness of how this, this is, what it means to local communities. And the fact that we have now have seen more awareness of, uh, of the communities that are involved in this directly, the, uh, the east side with Via Colonita and uh, in, in Silver Spur, it, it becomes personal and it becomes something that the city can get engaged with and starts to understand the importance of this. The educational process for understanding what these laws have done to us and continue to threaten us and continue year to year to year uh, become, become very, very personal to the communities themselves. And I think that that will also be measurable in the next couple of years as well. So they're the two top things. I do have a number of other issues, but um, I wanna stick with those and focus on those as if, if there's something that we're gonna get done next couple of years, that's one and two. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to question number two, and George, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm gonna paraphrase this particular question. It's a long question. There are many critical issues facing the city that have directly uh, impacted our quality of life. List, list, list. One of them that I'm picking out in particular is the increase in crime. If elected, what action would you specifically take to mitigate this issue? Good question. Uh, well, I'm. Crime is increasing everywhere, but the last report that I saw for 2023, Palos, Rancho Palos Verdes was in the top 15 of all municipalities in California in safety. So clearly, the system we have now is a really good system, and that system is contracting with the LA Sheriff's Department. They've done an incredible job. That is one of the bullets on my website you'll see. I fully support their contract. Uh, I attend the mayor's breakfast every month, so do my colleagues. We um, hear about the crime reports. There's been some upticks, but, but actually, compared to the rest of the state, we're doing great. And what it takes to stay there, I'm 100% behind the Sheriff's Department. I wouldn't change that. If we need to add patrols to, to counteract a crime increase, I would be for that. That would be worth allocating the funds for. 
Um, that's my view. Great, thank you. Jeff, same question. So uh, like George, I support the uh, Sheriff's Department um, in um, uh, sorry, uh, in uh, securing the neighborhood. Also, um, I do support the um, the volunteers uh, for um, the uh, neighborhood watches. Uh, I know uh, in our in my neighborhood, uh, we've uh, been very vigilant uh, in paying attention to what's going on in the neighborhoods, and um, that's. You know, those are the two key elements in order to uh, reduce crime uh, in our neighborhoods. Great. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Crime prevention is always a top concern, even in statistically low crime communities like RPV. Public safety is our city's largest budget item, about $8 million. So about a year and a half ago, the, the, the city council recognizing that if this increase would continue going forward, would really be unsustainable. So they started, initiated a process where we would take some of the administrative responsibilities away from the county sheriff's office and take on that role as part of the city as a way to flatten the curve on increased costs going forward. So while it's not visible yet to the community because it really hasn't been implemented, in the next couple of years for, for the next council, they're going to have a major role in formulating how that's gonna look. And for me, um, I'm, I'm supportive of that effort because it makes sense that we have to do something for, for budget management, but it's gonna be a challenge. And it's gonna take that next council to be involved actively in the direction that, uh, that uh, public safety relationship between the county and the city will look like. And there's three important measures for what's going to matter in that. First of all will be data quality that comes out on crime statistics. Because if we don't have that and we don't have good quality data, we don't know how to invest. We don't know what parts of the city to cover. That's critical. The, s the second is the actual results in terms of crime rates. Did it matter? Did it make a difference that this new partnership is better than, than the way we were just uh, contract services with the county? And the third is the cost benefit to operate the program. So maybe we can reduce crime, but it's, it, 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 it costs where it, it's not sustainable, or the opposite, maybe it doesn't, and we 15. need to adjust that. So on an ongoing basis, we're gonna have to assess that, and the next council, that's gonna be their prime responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. David. Uh, just like other candidates, obviously, I support our sheriff's department. It is our largest uh, expenditure, in, in, expenditure in the city. And as I said before, I'm also a big advocate of the of the new public safety division that's being stood up for the reasons that uh, Mr. Peristam identified. And um, of course, I uh, if you if anyone knows me. I really am a data junkie of sorts, right? I'm a techie person. We need to measure that. The statistics have to be right. We have to know that they're right. We have to have some sort of control over making sure that's true. But one of the things I'm gonna to add to this is that um, one of the reasons I think our communities are safe as they are now is we have a lot of community involvement. Neighborhood Neighborhoods are, are watching for each other. And I would like to make sure that we continue the programs that help those communities. In particular, the flock camera program, I think has been very successful for our neighborhood. If you're unfamiliar with that, this is, these are cameras that are, have license plate readers that you can put at the entrance to your, uh, to your neighborhoods. And it will take down information about what cars have come in, information like this car has never been here before. Um, and I think we found that, and the sheriff's department has told us when we've discussed it with them, that's been very useful. Um, the city has uh, helped uh, subsidize that for homeowners associations. I think it should continue. And they've also subsidized uh, individual ring camera type things as well. And so I think when we get down to it, we have the sheriff's department, we have our public safety division officers who are unsworn, but they can do various things and they can have a presence. They'll be in marked cars. And then finally, we have our community HOAs. 15. And finally, we have individuals. And I feel like we have a sort of stack of public safety that we need to hit on all cylinders with. Thank you. All right, Jeff, the next question is for you. And I'm gonna paraphrase the question. How would you deal with and how would you assist residents 
for the fact that the city of Rancho Palos Verdes and the entire peninsula for that matter is deemed a very high fire zone. There are three large fires recently burning in two counties, actually three counties, but anyway, the question is how would you deal with whatever you think you should deal with with respect to this high fire rating, if that makes sense? Uh, a little confused by the question here. Um, okay. Is it the, the, the city, I'll try it again. I'm trying to paraphrase a very long question. The city is rated a very high fire zone. Okay. What, what if anything, let me, let me pose the question. What if anything should a council or council member do to help mitigate or assist residents, for example, canceling of insurance policies, these types of things? And I, I don't want to answer for you, but that's what we're talking about. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in relation to this uh, high fire risk, uh, I know that the the, the city, uh, or uh, I guess the, several cities uh, in the South Bay, um, have uh, I guess we do have a ca uh, infrared camera system which uh, will help in mitigating um, fire fire risk, so we can reduce the um, the time towards a fire uh, to, to I guess to uh, respond to a fire. Uh, in relation to the insurance companies, um, um, the best we can do is, you know, have our, our homes um, ready uh, for um, these fires, you know, whether it's uh, presenting to the insurance companies that, hey, we our roofs are, set, uh, are a certain material and are fire resistant, and then other options would be, um, you know, brush clearance, which the county, uh, El county fire department uh, has required of us. Um, and, uh, if, uh, you know, not just to, to waste water, but um, have uh, sprinkler systems uh, to protect our homes. Um, so those are the ideas that I do have related to the okay. fire risk. Thank you, Jeff. Steve? Thank you. We have an emergency services plan that's been developed over the last couple of years, and it identifies where each of us residents, each of our homes are within the city. And it, what it does is it gives us the ability, knowing where we are by number, to how we should evacuate. So if people aren't aware of this, they need to download the app. You can get it from the city app and be aware of, of that notification process. It's a big deal because a fire in one location, depending on which way the wind's blowing, could actually determine which way we do evacuate. So that's something that's in place. I think the challenge with that for the most part is a communications challenge while it's on the city website and we get this your occasional cycle of information about it, it's something that needs to be really baked into us uh, for, for emergency services. The other things that uh, we have the infrared system and it's coincidentally the one, th the uh, cameras that are going towards Torrance, we're, we're calling uh, Torrance faster than they're recognizing they have a fire problem. So they're, they're very effective and it will help us be safe. The other, the other part is what's gonna come up from, from Cal Fire here. They're, they're in the middle of having their program with the different zones. So first we have our five foot zero zone where we're gonna, we're gonna have no vegetation going forward and then there's the next zone so many feet. And that's something that's, that's been slowed down because there hasn't been enough specificity in those programs. Well, they're coming. They're coming. So as painful that's gonna be, and I'm like everyone else here, have raised vegetation over the last many, many years. Some of that's gonna go, and when that goes, it's gonna necessarily be removed, but we're gonna be safer in our communities to do that. So uh, when that 15. time comes, we need to cooperate and reduce our fire risk. Thank you. Thank you. David. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd re reiterate some of the same things about the, I'm very happy to have our, our wildfire cameras available to us in the Know Your Zone. But I'm gonna sort of take a left turn here. Um, I don't know if that's the right for, but when I first joined the Planning Commission, 
And as I said, one of my missions was to deal with uh, high density housing. And one of, the, one of the proposals I put forward was that there was an inconsistency between high density housing and being in a very high fire severity zone. In fact, that is what was the crux of the ordinances that we were written that severely limited um, uh, high density housing in these zones. And I think we, we lost that over the years since it has faded away or the state has essentially identified that they didn't believe this, quote unquote. So what I would do now is we need to do, we need to get some data, we need to do a study, and we've heard that there are studies that, that identify that there's a true public safety risk in having high density housing in this high fire severity zone. And I think I would really press for us to, to look into doing that. And frankly, if I go even further, maybe even I made a left turn, I'm gonna make a right turn now, is work with CAL FIRE to try to downgrade us. If we wanna see our insurance rates go down, we have to be downgraded. It's CAL FIRE who decides what zone we're in and we need to look at if we truly believe that, that we can down, downgrade our zone, that's a way that which we can deal with uh, that high insurance cost. It's sort of a, it's a, it's a trade-off around here. Um, but um, there you have it. Thank you. George. Sometimes one of the challenges of going last is to come up with something innovative to say, but um, <laughs> I, I, I want to build a little bit on what was said because I've come to the mayor's breakfast a few times and heard the emergency preparedness, and it's excellent. It's actually really excellent. But, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And even we've been quizzed ourselves at that breakfast, so what zone are you in? Uh, <laughs> right? So it's the city can communicate to the maximum extent run the drills, have the, have the apps, and have the information on the website, still people have to take it on themselves. Um, but we'll do all we can, and have been, really, uh, along those lines. One of the prices of being beautiful and green is that you have trees that can burn, right? So that's, that's a trade-off that we uh, you know, have to um, be conscious of. The fire cameras work really well. They're good for crime prevention, and they're good for fire prevention. But the, but the real... The real um, uh, wedge point here is going with the high density housing because actually high density housing if it's all dense there's not a lot of fire risk because there's no forage left but what's so unconscionable about what Sacramento has done and to build on what Dave said is that the, the legislation that allowed these builders remedies specifically ignores safety so safety is specifically disallowed as a concern for the city I've got to believe that's actionable. I mean, it's, it's a hard thing to get around, but the safety with respect to high density housing in a fire zone is, is exit routes, that there's a possibility for people to escape. We won't have that in a lot of places, and if the builder's remedy overrides that, you're literally, the legislation from Sacramento is putting people's lives at risk. It's unconscionable, and I think that's a leverage point for us to uh, fight with, and I surely would. Thank you. All right, moving into the uh, big topic around the peninsula. Um, again, paraphrasing the question, what decisions, I actually said what three decisions, maybe it's only one, what decisions would you make immediately to address the landslide? What priorities would you select and how would you pay for them? And the first person is Steve. Thank you. Uh, the landslide. It's probably the discussion of the night. First, I'd like to say personally, I'm a 10-year uh, resident of Seaview. When I came to this city, that's the first place I lived. I'm a 35-year member of the Portuguese Ben Club. And my daughter, one of my daughters got married at Wayfarers Chapel. So this is personal, this is personal to me, and we have a major responsibility to help the people that are right now struggling to stay in their house. We have to help stabilize their situation so we get to the next point where we can, we can have a, a longer term mitigation plan, but that's the first step we gotta do is, is get to that stabilization for those folks. Now, I have three ideas with the, what we ha need to do with the landslide, st more strategic ideas. One is we need to be more holistic. We need to have a conversation as partners with City of Rolling Hills, 
who just an hour ago or two hours ago lost power to 50 of their homes. So I think there's gonna be a different recept receptivity on the part of their community to be our partners now because this is their problem as well. The, um, the, 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 second, the second area is we have a, we have a, we are a science project. The landslide, the new information about the landslide gives us an opportunity to get new eyes on this situation here. So what we need to do, I think, will people come knocking at our doors to take a look and be a part of providing input to what we can do strategically going forward. And I think we ought to take advantage of that. It's one of those rare moments. And the first step, I believe, is expecting to, uh, to see the, from city council on, on October 1st, we'll get the first feedback on the new situation with the landslide. Thank you. Thank you. David. Uh, this, is a, this is a rough topic because um, I've been working with the, the city for some time. Um, we clearly have a relief effort and a mitigation effort. I mean, we have to provide relief, but if I get right down to it, the real problem we've got is we're just not staffed. We haven't staffed this program in order to meet the needs. It's been overworked and everyone seems to have a part-time job in the city of landslide mitigation. We need full-time support. I've also talked many times about how we need to use non-destructive sensing technology in many different ways to understand what's going on underground. We have not taken in much in information at all to determine what is going on underground. There, our geologists have generated theories, and the very first theory that was tested in August proved that the theory that was true for years was in fact not true. It was very different. And in fact, the solution that was put on the table in hydrographers was rendered by the staff to be not likely to succeed. The source of all this is simply not having any information about what's going on underground. And there are many ways out there where this can happen. We're not the only people in the world who need to find out what's going on underground. It's happening all over the world and we can do it. And in the, the major piece about this also is that we can do it without destroying everything. We just can't take two tons of drilling equipment, put it in a backpack and start hiking up the hill. We need to be able to use airborne assets and a number of things that have been successfully used around the world that will hone us down to understand, truly understand what's going on underground so we can come up with a solution that not only lasts, but we can maintain it, we can monitor it and make sure it performs all the way through the rest of our lives. Thank, Thank you. you. George. I've ended a couple of my comments. Sure, can I get those seconds back here? Because I got a lot to say on this one. Um, so first of all, uh, this, this is a terrible situation, obviously. And um, there's constraints on what the city is allowed to do under the Constitution. The city is not allowed to write checks to residents in those houses. That's gifting taxpayer money to people with, with specificity. What the city can do, the city's done. The city's waived permit fees. The city's set up uh, an over-the-counter permit desk right in the middle of the community so people can come and get it same day. Um, the city's added law enforcement uh, patrols to curtail looting. The city's uh, loan generators and learn, loaned uh, sewer grinder pumps to people, uh, which you know they, they've been able to put to use. And of course, we've upped the road repairs to keep the road moving. Those are things the city can do. Um, but what I think this is a really huge problem, and what what I find missing and disappointing, it's a big it's a big ask. But this is a national disaster. Finally, Gavin Newsom stepped up and declared this an emergency in California. We need the feds to. And to whatever extent um, a, a city councilman waving his arms in one town in California would, we got two presidential candidates running, both of whom have a lot at stake here in California. Kamala Harris is from California. Donald Trump may be from New York, but he's got a really large complex 200 yards from the mudslide or from the landslide. Both of them should have an interest in this. We qualify for FEMA. The governing law of FEMA is the Robert Stafford Disaster and Relief Act of 1974 and amended through the years. Section 102C names a landslide as a specifically eligible disaster. Section 203 allows for pre-disaster hazard mitigation, which means even though there might be homes that are not affected yet, direct aid can go to those people from FEMA if FEMA is authorized by the president. And that's a situation when FEMA money comes, that money can go directly to people. It bypasses the constitutional restriction that the city's under. So that's an action item for us, for sure, to the extent that we can make that noise. Thank you, George. Jeff. 
Well, looks like everyone said everything about the landslide. Uh, so <laughs> um, related to the landslide, um, you know, for the residents that are affected, we definitely uh, need to help them and then also uh, mitigate uh, or slow the, the landslide down the best we can with the funds available within the city. Um, but, you know, uh, one thing we really need to uh, go after uh, through uh, the presidential uh, or I guess at the federal level is look for fund uh, look for more funding from FEMA in order to pay for this because city has a limited budget um, and we can only um, handle um, you know a certain amount uh, of the mit mitigation um, so yeah uh, that's really all I have to say thanks okay thank you on the on the same theme starting with David and this could be a short answer if you'd like it's what do you think the role of the Land Conservancy should be with respect to landslide mitigation, if any? Um, What's well, interesting, you mentioned that because I have just spoken with the with the executive director today in discussing this, and uh, their mission, of course, is to is to replant land, and they need to do that in these areas. Um, I think we want to help make sure their mission succeeds, even despite the landslide being there. And my discussion with her was mostly around what we can do to make sure that we don't destroy more land than we need to. And that's part of my point of making sure that we have a solution in place where we use advanced technology of many different types to be able to identify where we really need to destroy things. I think, I, I think their role is gonna be helpful. I think they can help us with of negotiating if we have choices where we can run things and where we can drill if we have to. Um, but I think we need to support their mission in this and consider it. Um, certainly mitigating the landslide is most important and I believe they, they understand that that's the case. Um, but I'd like to work with them to make sure their mission of, of, of keeping land is successful. And I'd also like to say that if we do do these things where we are able to use advanced techniques from many companies using expertise that the city does not have currently but could have, it will have two effects. It will help us find a solution much faster, prevent errors that we've, as we've made in the past, and also preserve the land. Um, we won't be, we won't be d destroying any more than we absolutely need to. Um, the second, the last piece is, is um, the Altamira Canyon lining. I think they realize that some lining has to take place. If we put in a whole number of sensors down there, we'll be able to figure out where to line the canyon and do the least damage to the environment. Thank you. George. I'm glad we cycled around again because I wasn't done from the last question. I'm gonna borrow a little time from this because they're related. Um, one of the challenges I think in getting attention dr drawn to this on the state and the federal level is that a hurricane or a tornado is a spectacular event. It happens, boom, there's a lot of cameras, right? This is a slow motion event. Now we have some visuals that are getting people's attention, but it's kind of a slow motion event, but it is of a scale that is equal to those other kinds of disasters. If a tornado rips through a town in Kansas or Oklahoma, they follow a narrow path. Is it really more than 250 homes that are affected there? I don't think so. I think this is equal in scale, and that's the message we have to get out. So I'm, I'm very disappointed that, not in our leaders, because I know our leaders have been trying very hard, but I'm disappointed that the federal government hasn't looked at this. As far as to answer the question here about the Land Conservancy, yeah, I feel like it's too soon. Um, this, this is gonna end somehow, and hopefully as much of the land can be stabilized and used as possible. Some may not be usable. And uh, when that time comes, if we identify, as, as Dave put, as, as, as little as possible goes to waste, but if there is land that is, remains unusable due to ongoing instability, I'd love to work with the Land Conservancy to make sure that it's um, uh, you know, stood up in an in a, in a, in indigenous manner. Uh, with indigenous plants and indigenous uh, creatures. Um, but it's, I feel like it's too soon. I mean, there's a lot of people suffering right now, so I can't really go too far into that. Thank you. Jeff. <clears throat> yeah, uh, just to continue on George's point uh, for the Land Conservancy, um, it, uh, it might be too soon, uh, but you know, long term, uh, once we do have an idea of uh, how much uh, land is uh, still usable. Uh, yeah, we do want to uh, replace the indigenous plants uh, and then uh, you know bring back any of the wildlife that um, may have been displaced. 
Um, but again, um, we're just going to need to see um, how much is still uh, available um, and and not destruct uh, not uh, unusable. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <clears throat> we're just starting out now with uh, a long term mitigation and where we stand with the changing situation. The Land Conservancy has an important role in this process once we have a starting point. They need to be at the table along with the other interested parties, the people that from, from hopefully both cities, uh, the people in Palisades Drive South, the different communities there, because there may be different answers for those communities. So they need to be an important uh, partner that needs to be heard. I think we have a common interest here that we don't want to do anything environmentally that would be more than is absolutely necessary. There's a recognition that people are, are out of their homes and there's a threat to other people that are stay, fighting to stay in their homes that they're under threat as well. So I think that's a good discussion, but all parties need to be represented and they're a key party for that, to be part of that discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And sticking with this theme here, here's another question. George, we'll start with you. And again, this can be a short answer as long as you want. And is there anything more that you think the city should be doing for the individual residents affected by the landslide and land movement? Well, right. So within, within the Constitution, you can't write direct checks to people. That's not allowed. You can provide support and services. You can waive fees because those fees wouldn't exist but for the disaster. Um, I think that th the answer to that question is going to unfold over time. We, we don't know where the next major movement's going to be. We don't know how those people will be affected. We may not know exactly what they need. So as those needs arise, the city has to address them as best it can within, within the law. And maybe I just maybe I'll just piggyback a comment here because there 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 could be someone who might say, well, you know, this is this is affecting a lot of people and it's really terrible. But there's sort of 96 percent of the rest of the city. How how much can we spend? And you know, that's not a callous question. It's a fair question. But I have an answer for it. And my answer would be that as as much as we can afford lawfully. And the reason is because now the landslide is there, but we all live on a hill. Tomorrow, it could be me. Tomorrow, it could be you. And we want the city there for us, too. So that's my answer. All right. Thank you. Jeff? So um, relate, related to supporting the residents, um, you know, like George said, you know, it, it could be me tomorrow, uh, you know, at, at the top of the hill. Um, you know, I, the city should be able to be or should be here to support us in any way it can through permits, uh, you know, through loaning of equipment. Um, and, you know, um, like uh, Mayor Khrushchev has uh, Khrushchev has, uh, has helped as well and in, in looking for solutions, you know, to provide um, a, a electrical power, um, you know, through my as a my microcell solar panels uh, or um, microgrid uh, solar panels um, and, you know, uh, setting up uh, other op options for uh, residents to continue to stay at their homes. Uh, so I think that's where the city uh, can help uh, those residents. So thank you. Thank you. Steve? Thank you. What, what the, we want to make sure that our expectation is that there's not going to be a, a bailout for for our community. We will get money. We will get money from the state. We'll get money from the federal government. We'll get money from the county. But it's not going to offset our responsibility and what we have to get ready for to make decisions that are absolutely going to have a huge financial impact on this city. We have to recognize that. There may be down the road three different communities are involved right now. There may be three different solutions. I don't know that. We're going to cross that bridge when we get there. The immediate part is to make sure that, one, that we can stabilize the people that want to and help those people that want to stay in their homes now until we get to a longer solution, longer term solution. But just want to set expectations here that there's, there's, there's going to be no magical answer financially to the responsibilities that we have as city leaders. Thank you. Thank you. David. 
yeah, I think we're, we're all in that area really hurting and probably hurting much more than we ever expected. So I think it's really incumbent upon us to, to spend a good amount of time and effort, and I think it's worth funding to help out. Um, you know, I think the city is, is taking a lead right now and I think should continue with essentially hurting all of the utility companies. They don't report to us, but we need to work with them. And I think that if we end up with the basic objective to say people get to stay in their houses and they're not evicted or evacuated, I think we would find that to be a good way to move forward. So we need to do the things that's required to get there. And there's, I see things with, with generators and such, but I think we could go further and, and help you know, get our utility companies to believe that they need to deliver services eventually. Um, and so, and I've also heard that Janice Hahn's letter to the governor suggests that $5 million she's uh, um, talked about could go directly to residents. Um, I'd like to investigate if that's true and how that's true. Um, and finally, the real end game here is we have to mitigate this landslide. We have to stabilize the hill and we have to remove the need for services. That is the end game here, right? Um, and that isn't gonna happen as quickly as we want, but I think that effort is just as important as the relief right now. We have to get people relief right now because they're hurting right now, but they will continue to hurt for a long time until we mitigate this and bring confidence back that they either rebuild, repave, and all that. That means a lasting solution in place, and that's, I think, the end game we have to get to. Thank you. Next question, shifting gears dramatically here. And uh, the question is, do you believe that wages for employees within the city should be determined by individual employers, by a ballot measure voted on by the electorate, or by ordinance passed by the city council? Apparently this is an issue out there. And uh, we will start with Jeff. So I think the, the wages of the city employees uh, should be based upon prevailing, I guess the, the I, I wanna use the word prevailing wages for, for other, uh, based upon other cities as well. You know, we, the, the city is contending with um, finding the best um, employees for uh, those positions. And uh, if we undercut their their salary rate we're not going to get the best employees right now the city has some of the folks that care the most about the residents um and uh, they should be paid i believe they should be paid accordingly um if you, if you believe that um we should be paying them much less then um you know we're not going to receive the services that we the city will need um so thank you yeah Jeff, if I may, I think the question was a little bit different. Um, okay. I'm not sure they were specifically talking about city employees. They were talking about wages being set by the governor, minimum wages for you know fast oh, food okay. workers, these types of things. So the question was, again, set by employers, and you're still going to stay within your time frame, but I wanted to make sure you understood the question. By the employers, by the electorate, or in this case, uh, the city council. Uh, so this is the... the so the wages of employees within the city, like the- Correct, the city. The workers. Um, so for, uh, so I think that again, similar similar, uh, similar to that, uh, I believe that uh, the employers uh, should be able to set the wages as they need to for their, uh, you know, for, for the best employees uh, for One the minute. tasks at hand. So I, I think that's the best. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Steve. Thank you. So, some of those choices are easy to eliminate. We don't want the city council to determine what the wage rate's gonna be in the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. That makes no sense. We're a small city. We're gonna start competing with other communities for, for labor. I mean, that, that's something that is, is, is just, doesn't make sense from the get-go. We have state laws that guide wages. If there's an individual employer that has to compete on an individual basis for employees, that's their responsibility to do that. We don't want to be involved in that. That's a private sector 
obligation responsibility given the state laws that are passed for minimum wage rules. I completely uh, agree with, or I should say the opposite, I don't necessarily agree with everything the state does in terms of its wage, wage laws that we've just implemented, but that's okay, that's the law, and let's stay out of that private sector business. Thank you. Thank you. David. Yeah, I agree. I don't think the city council should be setting wages. And furthermore, I, if the question is availed, should the city employ, uh, set minimum wages that are higher than the state? I don't think that should happen either. I think that uh, we basically have a free market economy. I think it needs to work that way. Um, and uh, employers should set their wages based on how they want to be successful. And if I just use this time to say, the city as an employer wants to be successful also. So we need to set our wages so that we attract the most people, the best people, and that we retain them. I wouldn't be, I would be happy if Rancho Palos Verdes had the reputation as being one of the highest paid places to, to work. Um, sometimes I, I tell people, if you wanna get to my house, drive to the edge of the earth. I mean, we are far away from every place. Our employees typically are not living in the city, and so they commute. So we need to make it very attractive for them to be here and, re and be retained here. We've had an issue with understaffing for as long as I can remember. We need to attract employees with, with some improvements in the Civic Center to make this a place they wanna get to. But I think the one, people, one thing people really understand is they understand how much they make. Compensation is very important. And like I said, I'd like the city to be known as the place where the best people go, get paid the best, and then we'll deliver the best for you and for everyone here. Thank you. Uh, George. <clears throat> I, could, I could give the short answer, the expanded answer. The short answer is no. Um, the expanded answer is to think about why I would say that. Um, obviously, the state and the county, and actually the city of Los Angeles, which we're not in, but affects our market comp competition, um, have minimum wages, and there's nothing we can do about that. That's the law. We have to, you know, our, the companies operating within our city have to comport with it. Um, but ultimately, you know, I'm a believer in freedom, and um, people should be able to negotiate with their employer for whatever deal they can get. Sometimes employees unionize, and that should be a democratic and free process. If they do, then they're negotiating with their union, with an employer. But that's not something the city should thumb the scale on. That's not our business. That's, that's, a private, that's a private transaction occurring in the private sector, and it's up, up to people to decide for themselves. So I would say we should stay out of it. Great. Thank you. This, this question seems to come up every election cycle, and it's shown up here three times, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask it again. Do you believe it is worthwhile for the city of Rancho Palos Verdes to pursue becoming a charter city? Steve. Thank you. Yeah, it does come up all the time, doesn't it? It does. Well, I think the latest uh, push for the charter city is uh, around uh, local control and the fact that we have a la lawsuit that the uh, charter cities actually won in, uh, in court about uh, almost a year ago now. And so that's put m new momentum and emphasis and focus on does it make sense to become a charter city. That's not a great reason. And here's why this is not a great reason, is because the legislature already this session has adjusted the SB9 case, which the charter cities won, and the basis for a lot of this interest in charter, being from a charter city is going to specifically call out the inclusion of charter cities in that legislation. So we're into a game of whack-a-mo with Sacramento when we go down and think that we can somehow or other outmaneuver uh, the legislature by becoming a charter city. It's not gonna work. There's only one way out of this mess with local control, and that is through a statewide initiative. And that's something that's been going on for a number of years now. It, we haven't got to the ballot yet through our neighborhood voices. At some point, we will get to the ballot. Unfortunately, as we speak earlier, it's, we're getting momentum, we're getting exposure, we're getting education statewide by the experiences through Builders Remedy from, and from other of the state laws. So it's coming. 
It's coming, it's coming slow. Education of, of an entire state population is, is slow, painful, and costly, but that's the way at it, this, and, uh, and we're gonna continue to have that fight, and as a city, as an elected city council member, I'll continue to support what our city's done in the past and support the initiative for local control. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. David. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I mean, uh, the fact that the uh, Charter Cities won in SB9 was a temporary victory. Um, I don't think that's a reason to, to bring it back on the table again. It seemed just to be the flavor of the day as a way to, to look that you could get there. Uh, and I agree with Steve, I don't think we're gonna get there that way. The legislature is not gonna let that happen uh, in the state legislature. Um, I also agree that the way, the end game here is our neighborhood voices or at least a ballot initiative that takes it to the people that enshrines local control with us. I'm very supportive of that, but I will add that I'm disappointed that two attempts to put it in the ballot have failed. So I may not be as optimistic that it's gonna happen soon. And so I'm still, I think we need to, we need to work on other ways to exert local control legally, but through public safety, as I mentioned, I was the one who originated the idea that, uh, that high density housing was inconsistent with very high fire zones. And I think we need to pursue that. Um, I think the California Cities for Local Control is interesting, um, but it needs to get uh, the word out. And the our, neighbor, our Neighborhood Voices is only going to go forward if everyone really knows what the impact of it is. So I agree with Steve that people are just getting to know what that means, but I'd hate to see it that a 500 unit apartment building gets built and that is the impetus for voting. We need to get that impetus out to them before this happens. Um, and uh, is it incumbent upon the city to do so? Um, it's a political statement, but it does in fact us. I know the city has made resolutions to support California cities for local control, local control. We can continue to do that, um, but our neighborhood voices has gotta be the end game for us here. Thank, Thank you. you. George. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, if, personally, I don't know enough about all the ramifications of being a charter city versus our present status to answer that question. I know the question arose because of the legal victory that I guess it was Huntington Beach or Newport Beach had their charter city and they won. I agree, I think that's temporary and I think the danger would be to try to jump on that to get some temporary relief and then find out that there's unintended consequences. I mean, that decision to change the incorporation status of the city needs to be really holistically thought through. Instead, I would prefer to go after this densification measures the way I alluded to before. I think there's real merit. There's gotta be, it's, it's just by common sense, it's gotta be against the law to put people's lives at risk and willfully. And, and so I think there's f more fruitful legislative way, or not legislative, but legal attack ways to go at it than flipping our status. So uh, I guess that's my answer. If we were to become a charter city, we should do that for a variety of reasons and that are all thought through and uh, not just for that one measure. Thank you. Jeff. <clears throat> so, uh, related to the Charter City, um, I'd say no, um, j just for the reason of, uh, you know, similar to how everyone else has uh, said it. Uh, it. It's, you know, we, we previously we, uh, uh, the, the, the city, or I guess the, the residents voted no uh, for Measure C, which was the Charter City um, uh, measure uh, in 2011. Um, you know, I, I too thought it would be a great, good, maybe a possibly a good idea to, um, you know, avoid the SB9 uh, situation. But, you know, uh, like Steve said, it, it's a whack-a-mole. So at this time, I'd say no to the um, charter city. But again, um, you know, as, as a city, we should, um, you know, work to, you know, gain local control, um, you know, through uh, whatever legislative measures we can. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the high density, mitigation um, uh, would be a possibility. So thank you. Thank you. Switching gears again. What do you know about the city's street maintenance remediation program and is it working in your opinion? We'll start with David. Uh, well, I'll be honest, I don't know a whole lot about the street remediation program. Um, but I've heard from other candidates and others that, that we have a lot of work to be done. Um, and I, 
I would say that we need to consider to con look at that. I mean, the one road that comes to mind for me is PV Drive South. Um, that is the probably the lion's share, if not 90% of what we're doing. And that keeps going up and up again. And to some extent, with all roads lead to the landslide, right? Um, and so if we want to stop spending one to $3 million a year on that one road, we need to mitigate that landslide. And that is, that's basically where I, I see it. Now, I know everyone has roads around that are, that need some work, and I'm sure we will get to those, and then we'll work through that. Thank you. George. I don't hear as much complaining about the quality of the roads in RPV, per se. I hear about it a lot in California in general. Um, are our roads any worse than the rest of the towns? I don't think so. But what I do hear a lot about is safety issues with traffic lights and such on certain roads, Hawthorne to be one of them. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to pretend I know a lot about this issue or what people think. I want to hear what people think. I do hear about the safety, and I know that the safety committee is working hard on that. Uh, because a lot of times people, what I've learned from them is that people think, oh, you just put in a speed bump. But a speed bump doesn't necessarily actually control speed. It's an engineering thing. It's, to me, it sounds like it would, but I've been told it doesn't really work that way. So I'm going to let the guys that really know about that deal with that. Um, but, uh, but if there's opportunities to improve the road service, sure, we should. Um, I haven't heard much about it from, from people I've talked to, to be honest. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, so I, I too do, do not know that much about the uh, uh, roadway uh, service mitigation. I, I, know, I know there are parts of uh, PB Drive East um, that are not uh, in, in the best of condition, and a lot of folks do drive up and down that. I do drive up and down that uh, as well. Um, and obviously, we do spend a lot, uh, you know, million plus dollars on PB Drive South. Um, I just want to uh, continue the uh, topic. Uh, that uh, George brought up with uh, traffic mitigation. Um, we do need to, uh, you know, listen to the residents um, in regards to uh, traffic, uh, you know, in the different parts of the town, uh, you know, up on Crest and uh, Crenshaw, uh, and then also on Western and work with uh, Caltrans and the city of LA uh, for the, you know, traffic uh, along Western Avenue. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I hear a lot about this. My neighbors are on my case. What are we going to do about our roads? Historically, we've had the best roads on the peninsula through the pavement management program that was initiated by, I think, one of the people is our monitor here. Uh, it's really straightforward with road maintenance. If you maintain roads on an ongoing basis, you can maintain them cheaper than if they start to deteriorate and get a different level of repair. And somehow or other, over about the last five years, because of the COVID years, staffing, and of course the two last rainy seasons, we've sort of lost our way. And now our roads are deteriorating. But we need to restore this program for two reasons. One, as I mentioned, with the cost of, of maintaining them goes up, but also at some point we're going to have a significant repair for PV Drive South. And that's going to mean that 15,000 trips a day are going to have to be diverted through other roads in our city, other arterial roads. And we need to have those roads in a condition where they can accommodate that situation. So this is something that just doesn't affect PV Drive South. This affects every resident in the city because there's going to be more traffic on our roads and we need to step in, restore this program, and get it back on track and, again, have the best roads in, in, uh, on the peninsula. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we'll start with George on this one. Big softball. What are your biggest concerns with the city budget? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, I, I'll preface my answer. I do have a spe specific answer on that. I'll preface it by saying that when I first joined the Finance Advisory Committee after moving here, um, I kind of came in a little bit kind of cocksure of myself and coming from the private sector, I said, ah, you know, it's government. We're going to find all kinds of ghost employees and wasted money. And when I came in, I was astonished. And I looked at the book. And I said, gosh, this place has run tighter than a lot of private companies I've worked for. It is really a well, well, well-run city. And uh, the, my predecessors and everybody that's contributed to that through the years should be very proud because we are surely amongst the very, very top echelon of municipalities in terms of our financial condition something to be proud of and something I would fully intend to protect. 
Um, the biggest threats, the biggest threats are uh, the costs of PV South. I mean, that's gone from being even, I mean, 500,000 a year a couple of years ago before the significant landslide. It was still landsliding, but it was much slower. Now it's bumped up to 2.5 million maybe this year and could go even higher. And that runs a risk of being unsustainable. And so then we get to the issue Steve talked about, like traffic diversion. And what I worry about when I think about it, and I made it a kind of an emotional plea before of doing what we can for the residents, but there's a reason we have guidelines in the city budget to preserve 50% of the general fund, keep a certain amount in CIP reserve, $5 million, is because we don't know what's next. Like right now, the landslide's it, and we're doing everything we can to help those folks. What if the big one hits? What if there's a major earthquake? All of a sudden, the whole city's affected, and we've spent all our money on one problem. So what I worry about when I see increasing costs on something like that road that are really starting to eat into the, to the excess money, I worry about what's next. And uh, so that's the concern. Thank you. Uh, Jeff. So, um, you know, I, I, we're, we're yeah, sorry. In relation to the uh, city budget, um, yeah, I, I took a look at the books as well. I, I was surprised. Um, you know, uh, coming from private sector, I, you know, uh, I too was looking for um, waste, and um, uh, the, the city, it, it, from a budget standpoint, is, is well run, um, and uh, hope to continue with that. I know that the city has won awards uh, related to uh, its, its budget. Um, you know, uh, related to the the cost expenditures uh, for the landslide and PB Drive South, that that is a concern, uh, and uh, I too do not want to eat into the reserves that we have. Uh, you know, one of the topics I did bring up uh, was promotion of local businesses and expanding uh, commercial tax base. Um, uh, you know, if we bring in additional revenue to the city, uh, you know, we, we can fund, uh, you know, other um, projects, uh, you know, like related to the, um, you know, um, you know, bring in, uh, uh, so is it one minute? Sorry. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, have the funding uh, in in order to improve the improve the roads and, and, and you know have additional funding for uh, the youth and senior programs. Um, but yeah, uh, again, my major concerns are you know major uh, these these large expenditures um, that uh, the city in, in the long term won't be able to uh, afford. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <clears throat> Ranch Ranch Poverties continues to be fiscally strong with minimum debt. Our challenge is the unknown cost of the landslide, especially with the current evaluation of the landslide's size and scope. Of course, the city will pursue any opportunities it can at the county, federal, and state level to help with our existing emergencies. But how do we do that with our budget? We need to manage the budget, as we discussed earlier, with the, with the uh, uh, relationship with the county sheriff's office, since that is the biggest budget item. It's $8 million out of about a total budget of slightly under uh, 40 million. But the sky is not falling. We, through fiscal prudence, conservatism are always the order of the day, and we will keep maintain our historic record of being a well-run city. On a personal basis, my career has been as a management consultant for one of the law four largest accounting firms in the world, Ernst & Young. Nearly all of our assignments are financial or have a major financial consideration in that decision-making of projects. My industry specialty is financial services. So I'm confident in my ability to address the financial management of our city going forward. Thank you. Thank you. David. Uh, yeah, I, I also have, have seen the, the books and gone through this and uh, you know we are, we are well run, um, but I'm gonna take a slightly different tact at this, which is the one thing that concerns me about what I see is that we've had a trend over the five years of underspending the budget. We've had a negative 5% on the budget and 5% revenue increase, which means we've had a 10% increase in cash, essentially. And my concern is that the purpose of the city is to deliver services to you. Uh, putting more money aside is great for the landslide, but if we set a budget and we set goals for that budget, we need to spend that money. We need to deliver the service to you because that's the purpose of the city. Underspending the budget is underperforming. And I suspect it's coming about because we're understaffed. 
and understaffing also means underperforming. And so when I see the budget at negative 5% in a five-year term, I don't see it as a healthy thing. Grant, granted, our finance people are overjoyed. There's more money to, to put in a bank account and get a few points on. But I'd rather get the work that was supposed to be done with that money because that's the purpose of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, if you don't know, there are bike lanes slated to run between PV Drive North and 25th Street on both sides of Western Avenue. What is your opinion of the bike lanes and what, if anything, can be done about them? And the first person is Jeff. Uh, so I didn't know that the bike lanes were going in, uh, but uh, I do have a concern related to the bike lanes. Uh, yes, it does promote um, uh, health and wellness for folks to uh, use alternate uh, transportation. However, that is going to cause uh, some significant uh, traffic on Western Avenue uh, for uh, our RPV uh, Eastern re residents. Um, what we can, uh, related to what we can do uh, to that, um, those roads are managed by Caltrans and the city of LA. Uh, so, we, we can talk with our uh, city partners and um, uh, uh, with the city of LA uh, in regards to it uh, and the Caltrans. Uh, however, um, uh, I, I believe we're gonna fall on deaf ears uh, because uh, you know th those are the, the two jurisdictions that handle, uh, handle uh, Western Avenue. Um, I know the city has talked uh, to them uh, related to traffic uh, and uh, ask them to ch make changes to uh, the the lighting, uh, I guess the, the, the stoplight uh, metering uh, in order to improve traffic. Uh, but I, I do have concerns uh, related to the uh, bike lanes uh, for our residents there. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I have a little frustration here. A couple of years ago, we were discussing this along, along the Western Avenue corridor, and we didn't have a lot of input to that process. Uh, the question really is safety, and my view at the time and my view today as a non-bike non rider that would take on Western Avenue or in a lot of other places because of the hills is the safety factor. In speaking with riders, they seem to be okay and that was enlightening to me. So if we're going to provide input, the people that need to be at the table to help us with what we think is gonna work, what is safe in these bike lanes, where they are along Western Corridor, and any other place that, that our, our residents ride, we need to have them as part of that discussion too. So uh, that's one of the situations where uh, the community has enlightened me and has changed my opinion somewhat, but I'm primarily concerned about their safety, and uh, that comes first. And in fact, I'd like to have some more input to that discussion, but we are seem to be limited with Caltrans. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, I agree. The safety is the first issue in this, and, and certainly there are so many entities involved in Western Avenue that we have to make sure we have a seat at the table and that we are looking out for the interests of our folks and anyone who, who rides there. Now, what I would like to do is look at this in the context of the whole Western Avenue corridor um, um, changes that are being proposed with around by adding beautification, trees, different things. I mean, I'm, I think Western Avenue corridor needs this development it needs to look a lot better. It needs to have a lot more development there. And there's a lot of things going on in the city to make that happen. Um, I'm not sure if I would consider bike lanes as part of that, but since there's a lot of work to be done on that road, uh, traffic calming measures, some high tech stuff, which of course I am, uh, I'm attracted to about uh, how, to, how to manage traffic and lights there. Um, I'd certainly like to see how this impacts and works with the entire corridor. Um, if it's being done solely on its own, I'd like to see the proponents of it tell us, tell, tell us why it's gonna be fine, why it's gonna be safe. I don't care, I, I don't think I know exactly why it would be safe or unsafe, but I'm willing to listen to it in both, si both sides to see who really wants this to happen and what their re rationale is. Um, I'm more than happy to listen to that and I would love to do that. Thank you. Thank you. George. I think it's tempting 
this is my first time running for office, you have a temptation to have an opinion about everything and whatever the issue that arises, we're gonna fix it, I'm gonna get on it. Uh, when I look at this Western Avenue thing, I've heard a little bit about it. I don't have an opinion about bike lanes. I mean, the bike is the greenest form of transportation there is, but I'm a little skeptical you're gonna see pelotons of people with jackets and ties and a lunch back on the lunchbox on the back of their bike pedaling their way down. I'm skeptical, but my understanding is this is really a Caltrans-driven thing. I don't think we have a ton of control. Yeah, sure, we should make our feelings known as the plans when we're asked, but to the degree they're gonna listen to us, I don't know. Energy and resources in a city are finite, and I would much rather spend my time shouting as loud as I can in Washington, D.C. to get FEMA money for the landslide and let Caltrans do what it wants with Western Avenue. I'm, I have a harder time getting excited about that. It might turn out well, who knows? Great. Thank you. And this will be the last question of the evening, somewhat of a softball. If you were elected, what would be the one issue or thing that you would cha champion and is that the most important thing for you to accomplish while on council? You with me? Do you have a pet I've, project you're up for, Steve? Go first, ahead. Okay, thank yeah. you. Well, we, back to our two most important issues, the landslide and uh, local control. I've spent the last year, last four years as an active member of, of uh, California Cities for Local Control. I'm one of those guys that call up contact, email other elected officials, local officials around the state of California, urging them to get on board and support local control initiatives, fight against Sacramento with the ongoing onslaught of, of poor housing bills that keep getting passed, and I'll continue to do that. Because that's really, with my background as a land use planner, that's what hits home for me, because it's wrong. You couldn't come up with a worse plan, strategy, idea, whiteboard approach to this than the city of California has pursued and double down and triple down on the uh, local communities. There's a lot of resistance in, in the local communities throughout the state. There's a serious disconnect between the state and local government on this, and we need to we need to win this battle at the end of the day. This is something with our neighborhood voices. In fact, I'm gonna be on the panel with uh, C Council Member Bradley next Monday at a neighborhood voice, our neighborhood voices Zoom call. There's on my desk out there, my, uh, my table, you can pick up a flyer if you wanna participate in that. If you're new to this, it'll be enlightening for you to see what's going on around the state. If you're an old time hand at this, you'll get an update on some of the legislation that's coming down this current session and to see what the, the next wave of things that is city council and a city we're gonna to have to address going forward. So that's my hot button and I'm gonna to continue to fight for that. Thank you. Thank you, David. <clears throat> uh, this is a softball question. All roads lead to the landslide. <laughs> That's basically what it is. We need to provide relief as our first priority because the conditions require that. But we have to get it under control or, or, or admit that it's never going to be under control, and I don't want to admit that. I think if we had a crowning achievement of the next two years, it would be in the news saying that we solved this problem in some amazing way, and that that would be our city would be known for that rather than being known for the place where things are falling into the ocean. That would be the crowning achievement of the first two years or one year or as quickly as we can do it. That's the place where I think I can add a lot of value. I think we're running a very low-tech theory-based operation and we need to be running a high-tech data-based operation um, if we plan to solve this. Now, I, I'm a big fan, I'm big fan of local control and I think that is an amazingly difficult problem that we have. However, not to downplay it, but it's a potential problem. Because, we're, because we are zoned does not guarantee things will be built. Our real enemy is the builder's remedy, which I think we have to address. I spoke to that earlier. But the housing is essentially a potential threat. The landslide is a clear and present danger, is a real threat that it won't wait for us. No matter what we do with any of the other things here, they can be kicked down the road a little bit. I don't want to see that happen, but the landslide cannot. It's going to move without us. It's on its own schedule. We have to fight that first. 
and that's where I think we need to go. Thank you. George. Yeah, everything everybody said so far are excellent initiatives, and uh, Steve's been on the local control for years and would do a great job on it. I know, Dave, you're an engineer. You know quite a bit about this landslide. To a certain extent, I think about answering this question from a perspective is what I could do. In other words, the, the, the fighting of local control is gonna be partly a lobbying initiative with other towns, but it's gonna be a lot of lawyers that we're gonna to pay to do things. And the landslide, if there is a way to stop it, I don't know if there is or not, but if there is, it's gonna be engineers that we pay to figure that out. But with my time and energy, what I can do, and where the city council has a lot of discretion and a lot of, it can really steer the outcome is the future of our city with a civic center, right? And now, we're not gonna start launching that in the middle of the landslide. That needs to be settled first. But 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 25 years from now, we need a new civic center. We're gonna be a backwards, atrophied city with, a, with, with people working in a bunker. How long can that go on? So, and, and within that decision-making process, the city council has a ton of influence. There's a whole range of what's in, what's out how big it is, how much we can afford to spend, how little we should spend, or how little can we, how cheap can we get it and get the job done. There's an enormous amount of discretion and a lot of work for us right here in the city council to do that we can't really pay engineers and we can't really pay lawyers to do. We have to do it ourselves. And so I think it might not be right away while we face these challenges that are imminent, but I think that's something that we have to address in the long run. We have to address in the long run, and I would make time for it. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, so for me, uh, although uh, you know local control, um, land use, and um, the landslide are very important uh, topics uh, for the city, uh, you know, like George said, you know, what can I do uh, during during my term? So um, you know, again, I, I'm looking to promote uh, local businesses and expand the commercial tax in, or in order to bring in more revenue to the city, uh, and then also. Um, expand youth and senior programs um, from the money that we uh, obtain uh, through additional tax revenue. So those are the two items that I, uh, I believe that I can get done uh, in my tenure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's give these uh, candidates a big round of applause for all they have to And if you want to stand up and stretch before closing statements, feel free to do so, because that's where we are right now. So. With that, Steve, we're gonna start on your end. You have two minutes. Thank you. I wanna thank the CHOA and Chamber for hosting this forum and for allowing us to address a range of topics that are important to us all, the residents of the city, and will greatly affect our city's future. Why do I believe I deserve your vote? Because knowledge, experience, leadership, and service matter. I know the city's the issues that face the city. I've already been involved extensively with many of them. I have real positions that go beyond mere platitudes on the issues that impact our city. I hope they've shown you some of those in my answers today. They have a clear, thought-out position, not just sound bites. I've explained my priorities for what our beautiful city needs to accomplish in the next four years, as well as the process to move forward towards those goals. But I also recognize that many of the issues are not static. They require a continual need for study, to ask questions, observe, listen, in fact, welcome the input and concerns, observations, and suggestions of the city's residents to use common sense, and the circumstances may change to show flexibility in how we address these issues and what the preferred solutions may be. I promise to be an active and engaged city manager, a city member, city council member, and will be prepared to start on day one. I personally hold two master degrees in land use planning and public administration. I began my professional career as a land use planner. Most of my career has been as a management consultant, the longest term with Ernst & Young. My career has been in the profession that focuses on solutions. I'm endorsed by Mayor Crookshank, Mayor Pro Tem Alegria, Council Member Ferraro, Council Member Bradley, as well as the Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. The broad support shown there is based on directly working relationships with them regarding city issues and the confidence that I'm well prepared to address the challenges before us and represent the best interests of the city and the city's residents and businesses. In addition, I'm endorsed by organizations that are important to our quality seconds. of life the Association for California uh, Deputy Sheriffs, ALADS, and California Cities for Local Control. Please visit my website, electparistam.com, send me an email, give me a call with your questions and thoughts. I welcome, I welcome them all, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff, two minutes. Great. Uh, 
Thank you, um, uh, Choa and uh, PB Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event today. Um, again, I'm a lifelong Peninsula resident, uh, so that I do know uh, what the city uh, may need. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, I do not have uh, endorsements from uh, all the, um, uh, you know, uh, local uh, uh, city city uh, members uh, today, uh, or uh, any of the other uh, county representatives. But I'm a resident, just like you. Uh, I'm looking out for the, the best um, uh, for our city uh, as a resident, and and um, you know. Um, a person, uh, or I guess a resident uh, that uh, wants to have his uh, family uh, live here, um, you know, for potentially a third generation. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm looking to promote uh, the local uh, businesses and commercial tax base uh, in order to uh, have um, youth and senior programs um, for our kids and uh, keep um, our residents uh, continuing to uh, spend money within the city rather than having to go to other cities to, uh, 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 sorry, uh, go to other cities in order to um, uh, take action or, or whatnot. Um, 30 seconds. Great. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, uh, I do talk on a, a better face-to-face, uh, a -face. Uh, little nervous tonight, uh, but I can be reached at uh, Jeff Chen for rpv.com or and you can reach out uh, by email or call. Thank you. Thank you. George. Well, you know, when we started this um, <clears throat> debate, you said there, there'd be rebuttals a lot if anybody said anything bad about their, their competitors. I have nothing bad to say about these guys. These are great guys. I mean, I've worked with these guys, their colleagues. I mean, David, you even let me mooch one of your waters. He's a good guy, right? <laughs> I'm getting to know Jeff. He's actually a really good guy, too, and he's got some, got some good ideas. We all hate densification. We all want to do everything we can to prevent the landslide. We all support the sheriff's department. There's not points of difference between us in those areas. Um, we're all gonna get the easy decisions right. There's no point of difference between us in that. The reason I want to ask you to vote for me is the private sector experience I bring to the table. I've been a financial officer for the last 25 years for companies large and small. The company I work for now, its budget and operational scope is about the same as RPVs. Um, when you need a good finance person is when the wind blows cold and something goes wrong. I was working for a plastics recycling company in 2008 when the Great Recession hit and the price of oil fell from $110 a barrel down to 15. I had to lay off three quarters of the company just to keep it afloat. The company I'm working for now is a live experiential company and I was there when COVID hit. You can imagine what COVID did to a live experiential company when no public events are allowed. You have to make really hard choices when you got five bills to pay and there's only money to pay three. How do you get through that? You got 12 employees, you can only afford to pay nine. What do you do? Those are the hard decisions. And finance officers are trained to stand up, face them, and make the right decision. In both cases, I kept those companies going. We're nowhere near that yet. The landslide is stretching us, but what you get in me, in my unique experience, is someone who's made those decisions in the past and could make them again if needed. For that, I ask for your vote. George Lewis, vote for me November 5th. My literature's outside. Thank you very much. Thank you. And finally, David. Uh, again, I, I also like to thank Cho and the Chamber for putting this on. It's been a great experience for me. Um, I like to say, when I started the candidacy, I started going around talking to people all over Rancho Palos Verdes, and I'm gonna go to see more of you. If I haven't seen you yet, I'm coming. Um, and everywhere I go, the people say how much they love this place, how much they love their neighborhoods. In fact, there are so many different reasons people love their neighborhoods. There are folks I spoke to who said they love the fact that it's quiet. Other folks said, we love being near the trail so we can get right there. Even the folks who are impacted by the landslide will tell you today that they love the place they live. It's the best place they want to be. Well, I think it's our job to make sure all of that stays the same. 
make sure everyone continues to say, my neighborhood's the best because of this, because we made that happen. We kept it quiet there. We get the trails open. We basically can uh, uh, have the folks impacted see their lives staying there for a long time. Um, this is gonna take a lot of work. It's gonna take a lot of innovation. And this is the characteristic that I bring over 30 years of running startup companies and bringing creative solutions. I brought up the first solution four years ago with identifying the, the, discount, the inconsistency between high density housing and fire zones. In 2021, the um, city council presenting me with an award for work I had done in the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine and the title was Innovation in a Time of Crisis. To me, this is the main thing we need is to find creative solutions and make good on them. And that's what me, I do as a longtime startup, longtime builder of things. That's what we need right now. And I thank you. Vote davidchura.com. Thank you very much. Round of applause for all these candidates, please. It, it, it looks like Dave wants the mic back. In closing, let me say thank you very much to the chamber and Choa for allowing me to participate. I love this stuff, if you can't tell. Um, it's been my honor to do it, and I'm just going to close by saying we shall overcome, we will prevail. There's no better city than Rancho Palos Verdes. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Jerry, I got to tell you, I have to... Am I on? I hope yes, still. Uh, I got to tell you, Jerry, that uh, after you get done with your uh, day job, I think you could become a professional moderator. Wasn't that wonderful? <laughs> so on, the, on behalf of the chamber and the 65 HOAs in Rancho Palos Verdes, uh, let me say how much I appreciate you all coming tonight. We have cookies in the back. I'm, I'm asking the candidates to stick around. That We were, had a lot of questions asked. Not all of them got answered. And so if you're in the latter crowd, uh, uh, please uh, buttonhole the uh, candidates and ask them yourself. And then uh, one, a couple other things. Uh, one, I think it's very powerful that we had the majority of our city council here tonight. I recognize the mayor at the beginning, Barbara Ferraro, uh, sitting here, and uh, Paul, Paul Seo uh, also joined us this evening, which is wonderful. You know, and when you're thanking a whole bunch of people, you always miss a few people. I see John Manny attack as our president, president emeritus towards the back, and... And here in the front is Noel Park, who served as our moderator uh, two years ago, and it's wonderful to have him back again. Lastly, the chamber is having their event Friday, October 18th. If you've ever been to the, cha the chamber uh, uh, annual legislative forum, very informative. It's going to be at the PV Country Club on the 18th. And uh, uh, let's see if I've gotten everything else that I wanted to talk about. I think I did. Thank you all for coming in tonight. Thank you.